Hello, and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm your host this evening, Brian Broom. I'm joined by Greg and Emily. And tonight we're going to be talking more about Elijah. I'm happy to be here for it. Uh, there's been no gnome kidnappings uh, this <laughs> evening. Not today, uh, gnomes. Not today. <laughs> So, um, Greg, why don't you start us off, give us some context again, and we'll jump into it. Well, the context goes back a bit. As we've looked at this, we kept saying, what, another Elijah article? Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> there's, this, there's a long train of thought here, because mm-hmm. there's a long history. Uh, it begins when Ahab of Israel marries Jezebel of Phoenicia, and they introduce Baal worship, which is nature, nature worship. The basic idea is that the state serves as a social engineer using magic to stimulate nature and produce a healthy economy, good crops, fertility in man and beast, and all of that. God was not happy with this, and in response to Elijah's prayers, God tells him to go say, no rain till I say so. And so for three and a half years, there's been no rain. Since Baal worship showcased the thunder god Baal, you, you, you know, this is bad press for Baal. He doesn't seem to be able to do with stuff, which is a threat to the monarchy, because if the king can't get Baal to do stuff, then maybe the king shouldn't be king. So with that in mind, uh, Ahab has been looking for Elijah, and, and God says, all right, it's time, go show yourself. And Elijah has called for a contest between the prophets of Baal and himself. It's set on Mount Carmel, which is Baal's backyard, it's Phoenician territory, it's up high, so uh, the clouds are nearby, Baal's a thunder god, and so the contest is, call fire from heaven, bring a lightning strike. And uh, you, you have lots of prophets, so you go first. So all the home court advantages, but nothing happens. And after lots of yelling, oh, Baal, hear us, Baal, hear us, oh, Baal, 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 hear us, oh, Baal, oh, Baal, for three hours or better, <laughs> and then Elijah starts mocking. Let me go for another three hours until the time of the evening sacrifice. And then Elijah calls time and just goes and talks to the Lord. He talks to Yahweh and says, well, show them I'm your God, I'm your prophet, this is your word, and um, that you are, uh, you're moving here. And God sends fire from heaven, and all the people yell, the Lord, he is God. It seems like win, 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 win. Uh, everybody is jumping on the bandwagon. Uh, Elijah is able to execute the prophets of Baal without any interference, in fact, with a little help. Uh, Ahab is cowed. Rain returns because Elijah prays, or, or God uses Elijah's prayers to send the rain. Everything is great. A personal, active, sovereign God who works by covenant has intervened to reclaim the hearts of his people. What could possibly go wrong? Go wrong. Go wrong. <laughs> uh, well, Jezebel sends a message to Elijah that says, you are so dead. And Elijah goes from mountaintop experience to bottom of the valley and runs. He runs all the way out of Israel, through Judah, into the wilderness, and he sets his sights on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. And when he shows up there, he has a very simple message for God that he's worked really hard on because he memorized it. He's memorized <laughs> it. He says it twice, exactly the same. And it amounts to, this didn't work. He's come back to the very place where Moses received the law to tell God, this whole covenant structure has absolutely failed. We gave it the best shot. You sent fire from heaven. I've been faithful and persecuted. No, I'm the only one left. Um, Let's just call it a day. And God ignores all that and says, go stand in the mountain. And Elijah sees and experiences fire, tempest, and earthquake. And they are all terrible and mountain-shaking. And yet each time he notes, God was not in the fire, God was not in the earthquake, God is not in the tempest. And then a still small voice in Elijah stands in awe, and the voice says, what are you doing here? <laughs> and Elijah <laughs> does the same thing again. Now, that's what we've seen so far. There are, there are a number of messages here. We, we, we get that, that Jehovah, the Yahweh, is not a nature God. He's not a puny little finite God who can be manipulated with magic. He mm-hmm. is sovereign. There's still something going on here, though. We have a tendency 
in our selfishness, pride, and laziness, and, and our desire for simple comfort, especially we Americans in the 21st century, to think that means, oh, now God's going to do everything our way. He's just going to step right in with revival and tra cultural transformation, and everyone's going to start tithing, and everyone's going to go out and evangelize, and it's just going to be so great because God's sovereign. So now everyone will do what they're supposed to do, and my work's done here. I can sit back with a mint tulip and relax. And <laughs> what uh, what Elijah has to understand is a couple things. First, special effects don't change the heart. We've we've been pounding on that for months or years now in this podcast. Special effects don't change the heart. Yeah, they saw the firefall, didn't do anything anymore than originally when God gave. Uh, the Lot Sinai, there was tempest and there was fire and there was earthquake and other things. And the people still uh, had a religious orgy celebrating a golden cow in the middle of all of that. Mm. You get used to the special effects, however big and terrifying and wonderful they are, and you go right back to your sins. They will not believe, they hear not Moses and the prophets, they will not believe the one rose from the dead. Second, the Mosaic Law was never designed to do that because these are the images of Sinai. God gave the law, knowing full well that the law in and of, in of itself does not work grace, it does not work conversion, it does not bring in the millennium, it does not change people's hearts. He, what he gave, there was nothing wrong with what he gave Israel. The problem is that Israel was a sinful, unbelieving nation. Finding fault with them, Jeremiah says, he began to speak of a new covenant. <clears throat> the problem wasn't the old covenant, it just, it did what it could do, which was not much, given the hardness <laughs> of the human heart. It pointed to Jesus. That was the main thing it did. Now, that's the first bit. Now, the, the last little bit. So, I've learned my lesson. I've learned not to trust in special effects. I've learned gospel, not law. So, now you're going to change everything, right? About that. <clears throat> and that's where we pick it up. And this, this is what the text says. Elijah has just repeated his uh, covenant lawsuit against God, saying it didn't work. And God says simply, go your way. Return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, that's towards Syria in the north above Israel, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king of Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of abel Mohala, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy robe. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. That's internal civil war and foreign invasion. And that's lawyers call, or covenant lawyers, prophets, calling for more covenant lawsuits to denounce Israel's sin more thoroughly and call down more of the same. Uh, that's not what I meant, Lord. <laughs> not that's really? No? Not um, what I wanted to hear. <laughs> no. I mean, that sounds so, you know, amillennial or something. Um, it sounds <laughs> like it's... Um, Victory? Yeah, victory? Messiah? Uh, Messiah. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Messiah's not mentioned here directly. You know, you can so relate to Elijah, right? <laughs> when it's Elijah. like, okay, I figured out what I was supposed to do, Lord. Now just make everybody else do what they're supposed to do and everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just everyone get their act together. I figured it out. They can. Mm. Just, I, I'll go back and I'll explain it maybe. Maybe. I mean, he's he's still back at the, they broke into your covenant, killed your prophets, and they died your word, and I'm, only, I'm the only one left. But that's not, God does not, God does not come in. You know, sometimes in our complaining, God does not step right in with a theological explanation of where we're wrong. Mm. And, and sometimes when we find someone in who's our responsibility, our flock, our child, our student, Sometimes it's it's trying to step in and argue the theology is not necessarily always the thing that needs to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes it seems like the the theology sorts itself out after you've been through the heart change, mm -hmm. where like you the Lord shows you a truth in your heart before you can articulate it, and it, yeah. He does that by refining fire. <laughs> Refining fire, and I have some things I want you to do. Um, mm -hmm. Back in my previous school, there were a couple of girls who 
uh, were having boy trouble. These are high school students. They were having boy trouble. And one of the moms came and took them home so they could talk about their boy trouble. When their teacher heard about that, he said, you know, they should have stayed in an algebra. There's nothing better than some algebra for boy trouble. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the, I mean, that's and that's kind of the point here. Sometimes we just need to get back to work. Yep. And and this is a good lesson for for young parents with kids. Your kid's grumpy and depressed and just wants to laze around. Go have him weed the garden. Go have him paint something. Go have him collect the garbage. Go have him go mow the widow's lawn next door. Sometimes we just need to get up and get busy. That's a, also a very good reminder for adults as well. Yes, it is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, at the beginning of this, when Elijah was depressed, God did not immediately address him. In fact, he made him take a nap twice and gave him <laughs> and gave him food. He did not engage. He did not reprimand. He did not particularly encourage. He just said, you're going on a long journey. You don't got the strength for it. Here, have some food. Now, take a nap. Go to bed. Uh, man is body and soul, and sometimes mm -hmm. we need to tend to the outer man before the inner man's ready to listen. Like yeah. James says, you, you can't say, go in peace, be warmed and fed, when you haven't actually warmed and fed them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of what God's doing. He's getting Elijah busy. The interesting thing, just in passing, is that Elijah um, only does one of the three. He He never gets around to the others. He's busy. <laughs> God has things for him to do, uh, other chores. And so he eventually delegates these to Elisha, who does fulfill them. Uh, but we need to look at what, what these tasks were, what they implied, and, and why there's not a clearer mark of hope. Some, uh, let me just say this while this is in my, in my head. <clears throat> Sometimes when we talk about hope, especially eschatologically, all kingdoms, all kings shall bow down before him. All nations shall serve him. Go and make disciples of all nations. All families shall be blessed. Oh, that means within 20 years, the whole world's going to be Christian. No, that's not what that means remotely. <clears throat> okay, long perspective, long perspective. Sometimes it's better just to say, yeah, you know what? It's going to get really tough for a very long time. And your grandchildren may see the other side of this. <gasps> but that's not very optimistic. It's part of accurate. God's plan. <laughs> it's accurate. <laughs> you think God doesn't know what he's doing? So, so what's going on here is we have to trust God. When the moves he makes, the cards he plays, look to us like complete surrender, complete disaster, like he's taking five steps back, and, and it's not the way we would do it. We look at our particular ministry. But if only God would have blessed, we were, everything was set, it was key, we had the right people, the right time. If God had just poured out his blessing here, but we crashed and burned after three weeks. What was that all about? Where was God? What's God thinking? Didn't he know we could change the world? <laughs> well, mm -hmm. part of the problem is probably the pride there, <laughs> thinking God couldn't do it without you. Yeah, there's that, isn't there? I, I also think there's two kind of connected points to that is is one you can think of how many uh well broader evangelical but also a handful of reformed ish mega churches led by a personality mm. have crashed mm. and burned because they essentially thought we're the ones that are changing the world for the better it's all us and god's so lucky to have us mm -hmm. uh and then also not not directly related to that point is going back to what you're saying about, you know, sometimes you just need to be prepared for a long haul of what looks like defeat. Mm -hmm. that, you know, I feel I am particularly equipped to this as the podcast's uh, representative on millennial. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I respect people who come to their differing conclusions from mine. I don't respect people who then change their Supposed convictions brought on by scripture because the news turned bad for a week. 
yeah. and they start to question their post-millennialism or they start to question their all-millennialism and think maybe post-millennials are onto something <laughs> and I should think about them because you know X, Y, and Z happened in, in, in politics. Yeah. Yeah. That's let's, let's get our eschatology from the newspapers because that's always worked so well. It's always worked yeah. so well and you know, I, I have always found that funny that people will look at the news and be like, oh yeah, hashtag that post mill. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you're doing like – in different words, you're doing exactly what you like claim dispensationalists yeah, are yeah. doing erroneously. Mm-hmm. Um, so we need to really, like you said, keep that long term perspective and mm-hmm. not look from week to week. I mean, we can look at things and say, like, hey, there's hope here. I mean, I yeah. can do that without being post millennial as well. Um, <laughs> I think you need to address the pan millennials because I feel left out of this conversation. <laughs> That's Everything true. Will I mean, pan I feel out like all right. I, I feel like awe and pan are like friends, you know, like really <laughs> close friends. Like they're almost the same. <laughs> we are. Like we're all three here together on this podcast. So it's true. Yeah. Sometimes the problem is that we have labels. Um, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for labels in their place, yeah. but sometimes when a label can mean five or six different things. <laughs> yes. It ceases oh, to be helpful. Like, uh, it ceases to be helpful. And um, I tend uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I tend yeah. to, there's a lot of labels that I kind of warmed to when I was younger, never really wholly embraced them. But yeah, if you ask me, okay, kind of, if I, if I get to define it, sure. Um, I, I, a lot of them I don't, I, I'm even hesitant to say Calvinist or Reformed anymore mm-hmm. because of what people think that means. <sighs> Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm still using covenantal, but that'll probably go the way of all flesh too, and end up with just <laughs> biblical. Oh, that's cheap. Everyone thinks they are. Well, at least it's a good thing to think. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> that's something. <clears throat> when I say biblical, I mean it's what the Bible says, as yeah. opposed to what you know the latest New Orthodox theologian says. So at least it's got a little content. Anyway, let's go back and see. <laughs> I, I think honestly, the best label you could ever claim is. I'm not a 20th century liberal theologian. Like that's basically. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> oh man, can't we aspire a little higher than that? <laughs> Look, I'm just I'm I'm going for the the lowest hanging fruit here. Okay. <laughs> but what you said, Brian, about um, thinking we're indispensable reminds me of Schaefer's commentary on Joshua, where he mm. talks about, you know, Moses was special. He was picked out. And then Moses died, and God was okay with that. <laughs> he he wasn't taken by surprise. He kind of actually planned it and told Moses what was up. Um, and so he Moses had prepared was, Joshua. He he wasn't Moses wasn't, wasn't the be all end all. Yeah, yep. and Joshua wasn't Moses. You know, so and it was, every, it was okay. every other prophet. Up until Jesus, everyone was like, "Is this is this the next Moses?" And like Moses was the benchmark for yeah, the prophet yeah. of God, mm-hmm. and he still died. Yeah, he still had the wages of sin against him because he was human and not the Messiah. Mm-hmm. And that's probably the most important takeaway we could ever tell you is that <laughs> no one except Jesus is the Messiah. So don't <laughs> think that you're indispensable. <laughs> so the gospel does come in here someplace. Mm-hmm. The uh, the three tasks. Let's look at them. Um, mm-hmm. probably briefly, because they're, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, go to Syria and anoint the next king of Syria, Haziel. Haziel, we find out later, he's not in the established line. Uh, the kings of Syria bore the title uh, ben Hadad, son of Hadad, which was their god. Haziel was a, uh, a retainer in the court. And when, jo- when Elisha comes and says, God says you get to be the next king, Hainsiel took that as permission to commit regicide, killed his king, and took the throne. Um, God didn't say to do it that way. God had very, lost control. Very Scottish play of him. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but the point is that Syria was not Israel. They were not God's covenant people. God had not sent them prophet after prophet. They had no special relationship with Jehovah. They were, the only connection was they were the nation to the north. They were the long-term enemies. A good deal of First and Second Kings is Israel and Syria attacking each other back and forth. <laughs> um, and then right at the end, they decide, oops, <laughs> Assyria is even a greater threat. Let's get on the same side. And that doesn't save either of them. And that's that. Um, but here is God sending a prophet to a pagan nation saying, I'm picking your next king. And uh, as it turns out, it's going to be by, by regicide. 
Uh, and uh, the people of Syria don't get a vote. The king doesn't get a vote. Even the guy who's going to be king didn't ask him if he wants to be. He's going to be king. <laughs> God expresses complete sovereignty with respect to a pagan nation and does not apologize because, you know, they haven't covenanted with him. So what's God doing there poking around? They don't believe in him. How can God possibly tell them what to do? And he's not choosing like the most upright of their people no, either. No, he picked a bloody murderer to be king. Um, this is not. We we sometimes get the idea that God is desperately looking for a few good men to be rulers of the planet, and uh, really uh, the problem is he can't find any. But uh, we. Oh we, Lord, if there be but five righteous <laughs> yeah. men in Syria. Yeah, but he doesn't even say that. He just picks a bad guy and puts him on the throne. And and you and here's the next thing, and we get we get this from what follows. Well, at least he put somebody there who will be, who will be nice to Israel, right? No, as a matter of fact, he put someone there with the deliberate purpose of having them invade and destroy Israel. Um, wait, um, my Jesus isn't like that, though. Yeah, you got you, your Jesus might not be, but this Jesus is. This is what Jesus is doing here. He's well, don't we all know that you know Jesus is so different from the God of the Old Testament? Yeah, <laughs> wait, Marcionism. <laughs> yes, yes, Marcionism. For those of you who don't know that, it was an uh, an early Gnostic who renounced the Old Testament as um, a different kind of religion ruled over by a God who was basically a bully, uh, and then Jesus came along and God became a Christian and things were better. Mm -hmm. Which is often how the Old Testament is taught. Yeah, it's very often, Which, unfortunately, yeah. how the Old Testament is taught. Yeah. Well, that's the first thing. The second thing, go and anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be king over Israel. Now, at least we're in Israel, we're among the covenant people, but Jehu was not in the royal line. He was not in the line of David. The line of David ruled south in Judah. He was a captain. He was a warrior. So far, so good. But basically, by anointing him, you are committing Israel to civil war and um, revolution. You're telling a, a general, go assassinate your king, his family, and everybody else who might possibly be involved in that, and wipe out, oh, and wipe out one particular religion in the process. But, but doesn't God approve of freedom of religion for all? No. <laughs> not in no. heaven. Not in heaven, not in, even in hell, technically. Because people are there <laughs> in hell because they pick the wrong religion. And God can, continues to remind them of that. Um, and on earth. No, it's, no, there's, Jesus is the truth, the, the life, the way. And, and, and so that, but also, again, political revolution. You know what happens when there's a revolution? People, people die. Die. Mm -hmm. Fortunes are lost, families are destroyed, cities are burned. Blood runs in the street. Blood runs in the streets. Yeah, it's not nice. And yet this is what God commissioned Elijah to put in motion. So once again, we're left with this, but this, this isn't, this is not the God I know, and this is not the way God should be doing this. I mean, he should have... Think of Jonah. Yeah, if Elijah had gone like Jonah to Syria and all of Syria had converted, and then God had installed a godly man on the throne who would dismiss the prophets of Baal and have them leave the country and reinstate Jehovah worship, yeah, that, that would be so cool and wonderful, and it would so prepare the world for the coming of Messiah. Yeah, God did not consult with us on this, and that's not what he in fact said. And like one. he did that with Nineveh. Yeah. I mean, he, he there's that wonderful line in Narnia, <laughs> which <laughs> is not scripture, but uh where Aslan says, You don't get to hear somebody else's story. Yeah. Um yeah. it's it's that's not how he works. He's telling your story with your life. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and and your story's not that story. So mm -hmm. and then thirdly, go appoint the next prophet. Uh, Elijah probably liked that one, actually, because he wants, <laughs> I mean, he wants to quit. So set up your retirement plan now, move early, move soon. We're not told if he knew who Elisha was, but uh, he's told the town. And since Elisha was from a wealthy family, it wouldn't have been hard to find the man. And it turns out that Elisha is, in fact, a very godly man. 
uh, who's ready to jump at the word of the Lord. So when Elijah finds him and gets to know him, I'm sure there's a great deal of encouragement, uh, things that aren't said in Scripture, uh, because Elijah in the end just entrusts everything to Elisha, and he, figures, he finishes the mission that Elijah doesn't, because Elijah's not long for this world. God's going to take him home because he's about done. But the good news is that when Elijah goes, God has an adequate replacement, kind of like the Moses Joshua thing, who will do what God needs done. So Elijah can lay down his burden, his calling, knowing that whatever it is that God wants done, and in particular these tasks, there will be someone to do it. So in, in, in laying, when you, you know, when you begin a ministry, or a part of a, of a small ministry, and you see it begin, and you you, you work to build it up. <clears throat> there, there does come the day when you're ready to retire, or you're being moved or transferred or something, and the temptation is to worry. I spent all this energy building this thing up. It was so important. God has used it so much. And now if I leave, uh, uh, I don't, I mean, these are all good people, but I'm not sure I trust them to continue the vision. It's not your vision. At least it should not be. your message. Yeah. And sometimes we have to let go. The Puritan uh, John Cotton wrote uh, an extended, well, he preached a sermon called The Way of Life. It's um, in written form. It's a long, long essay, you know, typical Puritan, point one, point <laughs> one, under one, point uh, use one, under point, you know. Because you're here all day. <laughs> yeah. But part of it, is after talking about how you fi- what a warrantable calling is, and how you find your calling, and how you live in your calling by faith, he ends with, and how you lay down your calling. Mm. Because sometimes that's the hard one. And, and that can be with, say, a Christian school, or a pastor having to leave a church, or some other ministry, or it can be with parents having to let mm. their kids go mm. out on their own. Mm-hmm. Well, how are they going to do it if they don't follow all the things I set up for them to follow? I'm pretty sure it, they'll manage. Yeah. Is God still their God? <laughs> oh, yes. But, you know, they're not doing this and this was always so important to us. They're not really doing that. I don't know. Yeah. You don't have to. Not your concern. You've done what you're supposed to do. You can keep on praying, but ultimately you trust God. You let in. <laughs> the one Disney movie I never thought I would keep quoting, but sometimes it just applies. You have to let it go. Uh. Sometimes the um, the nature of the mission, though, and and it's it took me a while to figure out. Well, it took me a while to try to figure out, and then it was pretty easy. What was meant by the sword of Elisha? Because so often, when you think of sword with respect to a prophet, you're talking about the word of God. And that could be conversion, and that could be good, but that's not the flow of what's going on here. And in um, in Hosea, who also ministered to Israel in the north, God, in summing up the work of the prophets, says, Therefore I have hewed them by my prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth. He's not talking about conversion or revival. Israel never experienced that. He's talking about the prophets calling down covenant lawsuits, calling down covenant sanctions, which produce more of the same, more internal revolution, more anarchy, more plague, more foreign invasion, more famine, uh, far from being people who come with happy messages of revival and renewal, the prophets in Israel almost uniformly spoke of judgment in their day. Now, they pointed beyond their day, and in the last days, a lot of important things were going to happen in the last days, a lot of happy good things, but they never put it on a timeline. Well, when are the last days? It's just left. When Messiah comes. When's that? Mm, When Messiah comes. Hello? Hello? Mm. So, this is is, uh, an unmitigated message of judgment. Now, that... we, we, We love our neighbors. We love our cities. I love California, despite everything. (laughs) But... You know, I'd love to see revival on a massive scale. I'd love to see revival in California's churches, let alone in the secular surrounding culture. 
I don't know that God's going to do that. And right now it looks like very possibly he will be doing exactly the opposite because things have continued to decline. People leave the state. There's new versions of plagues and diseases. San Francisco is rampant with all kinds of disgusting things, morally and medically. Mm -hmm. um, people are flocking away from San Diego once the garden spot of, of the country. You know, what, where does, is there a stopping point? Will God intervene? Will God send revival? I don't know. I know God's very much at the move all over the world. We keep hearing little reports here and there from obscure countries where revival is taking place, but around here, mm, I don't know. But it's one thing for me to look at the world. It's another thing when I start realizing, I know lots of people who live in California, Christians, brothers and sisters, people I love, and they're having to go through all of this. And some of them aren't going through this, they're leaving. Idaho and Tennessee and Florida are getting all, Tennessee, yeah, especially, are getting all kinds of my old friends, because right mm -hmm. now that's, that seems like a better place is for them. But there's something that Elijah, along those lines, Elijah had missed, something he did not know, because twice now he has said, first to Israel and then to God, I'm the only one left. <laughs> he did not, I mean, it was assuming that that wasn't pure hyperbole. Even if it was largely hyperbole, he he honestly thought there weren't any worshippers of Jehovah left. His last shot was that mountaintop thing. And, Maybe he uh, didn't believe Obadiah. Yeah, he hadn't seen the other people. <laughs> yeah, well, the other pot that's and that's likely, but there is one other possibility that when um, the victory was announced, the prophets came out in the open mm. and Jezebel and killed were, them. Yeah, yeah. So we don't know. It's not clear whether Elijah is just. Um, ranting senselessly or whether things had actually gotten worse. And it doesn't matter for the, for the point of what God's saying. Things were bad enough. And yet God says this, Yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Mm -hmm. 7,000 who have never given into Baal worship. Now, first, that's, wow, 7,000. I mean, it's not huge. The little town I grew up in was about 6,000 people. Um, 7,000, it's, it's not a huge, symbolically, seven times 1,000. That's, that's a number of completeness, of fullness. So there really are that many people left, people who have not compromised one whit, people like me. Wow, that is really cool. Wait a second. One, I just called for a famine that lasted three and a half years. And all these people, these 7,000 brothers and sisters, they had to live through that famine. Mm. There were no special rainstorms for the elect. There's no note that God somehow imported food and water for 7,000 people on some kind of special freedom train. <laughs> they went through everything the ungodly went through when I prayed for famine, when I prayed for drought. Huh. Oh, wait. And so I'm now being commissioned to start a series of revolutions and wars in the North. And those 7,000 are going to go through all of it. Now, individually, God may spare a life here or there. God may sneak a family down into Judah where they're safe. And yet overall, by and large, these people are going to suffer. They're going to experience tribulation. All the fallout of, we described earlier, of war and anarchy and revolution, they're going to go through this, and I don't know where it ends. That's a sobering thought, I should think. Mm -hmm. You call for judgment, and then suddenly realize, oh, but there's no rapture for the saints. Mm -hmm. You know, dispensationalism has thrived in this country so long because people— Christians, evangelical Christians, have been convinced that the rapture means they will never see tribulation. When I was, I think I must have been at about seventh or eighth grade, I was talking to the guy who sat at the desk in front of me in school. I don't remember how, what, what we were talking about, how it came up. We didn't normally talk about Bible prophecy for sure. <laughs> but I mentioned something about, about the church going through the tribulation. And he said, what? Why? Well, well, then what's the point of being saved? Hmm. Now, Ooh. he's, you know, a 12-year-old kid, give or take. He can be forgiven for thinking like that, but he picked, that up, picked up that idea someplace from his elders, from his church, which yeah. is rather, well, the largest 
Baptist church in, in the Reading area. Yeah, we're being saved so that we don't have to ever suffer tribulation. Since we're not going through the Great Tribulation, we're never going to go through any kind of tribulation. And that's why you have to come to Christ now. You have to be living like people who aren't going to be around much longer so that you never have to suffer or live an uncomfortable life. And also, inversely, in a weird way, it's, it is part of what pushes them towards political action as well. Everything is a threat to the gospel. Everything is a threat to the safety mm -hmm. that you think you've won. So you need to be extremely involved in politics and vote for the right people and, you know, be involved and push for X, Y, Z. There's a, certainly a good level of that kind of engagement to be had, but it sort of becomes the unintended tack on to the gospel. Yeah. You know, what, what happened historically in America from the time of the Scopes trial forward is that the church, having for many decades pushed for reforms that were not particularly biblical, but they were done in the name of Jesus nonetheless, mm. uh, realized that on this one blatant thing, evolution, as it appeals, as it appears in the public marketplace, in the, in the school, um, the church lost. I mean, yeah, Scopes was convicted and tried, and, or convicted and, and had to pay like, what, $10 or something, I don't remember what the fine was, but the church was a laughing stock. The leading Christian representative, um, William Jennings Bryan, looked like an idiot. And Christians said, uh, in light of their dispensationalism, well, that was stupid. That was a pointless. Obviously, Satan runs the world. Satan runs politics. Now he's running education. Evolution is just going to take over. So what that means, of course, is Jesus is coming back really, really soon. And from there until Jimmy Carter's election, the church stayed out of politics because mm -hmm. the world belonged to Satan. With Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carty, Carter, the man from Plains, Georgia, who'll never lie to you, was born again. And that was enough to get a lot of Christians to the polls. Born again. Yeah, we know what that, we know those words. Chuck Colson had wrote a book called Born Again. We know what we know now that, what that's mm -hmm. all about. So we should vote for this guy. And they never asked what in the world Jimmy Carter meant by born again. Turns out later he said, it means there's a little spark of divinity in all of us. Um, but that at least opened up the church. So when Ronald Reagan comes along, we see yet another, and this time the issue is abortion. And that seems a little less negotiable because now babies are dying. And that little bit of success kind of switched channels for us for a little while and gave us what you've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. The gospel is important, but now particularly if we can deal a couple of death blows to some of the major cult, uh, cultural villains, then that's the hallmark of revival. And it's kind of a throwback to the early era when if we can bring about revivals, then we bring about the millennium. And the gospel kind of recedes into the background yet again. Well, we do have to remember that uh, Reagan is standing against the evil empire, right? Yes, Which he was. is avowedly against Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. So, like, there, the, there's but, kind of a mixed bag here. <laughs> yeah, but the interesting thing was that this time that was okay. Mm -hmm. Before it had been, well, you know, evil empire, Russia's going to invade Israel, and that signals Armageddon, so, you know, you can't really let stop it that. Let it happen. Let it go. Uh, there we go again. But, um, <laughs> but um, th yeah, that time, because things were, the, the climate was a little bit different intellectually, different forces were in play, there was a, a, a temporary cultural optimism of we can make a difference, yeah. but it didn't last. Mm -hmm. um, someone like Jerry Falwell, uh, who helped create the whole idea of the moral majority and Christians getting back into politics and things like that. He, he, he did his best according to his lights to lead the movement for a while, but in the end, he just, it wasn't him, it wasn't his cup of tea and he backed off and the thing disintegrated because there is no moral majority and, mm -hmm. and it's it, political action, although it has its place does not change the hearts of men, which is, yeah. of course, what we're talking about here. There's one thing political action can do. It can absolutely destroy a country if it's <laughs> the wrong sort. And that's what Elijah is being told, set in motion political action that will absolutely destroy Israel. <laughs> and in the end, I mean, we don't even get as far as Assyria. We get through Syria, the step beyond. Okay, so when Syria is done and it all gets better, no. Then this war monster called Assyria shows up and Israel goes into captivity. And then... 
Yeah, about that. Um, what? Yeah. What? What happens? Well, Israel as a nation never exists again. The remnant, those seven thousand, God has a plan for them, and, and, and it's going to be two things. And it's, none of this gets explained now. It's only when we, with the coming of the New Testament that we begin to see what God was doing. See, all those people, most of them are going to just get get mixed in with the nations and lost to history. But out of that remnant, those who are faithful, those who cling to the God of Israel, when the restoration comes, some will return with the those returning from Judah and will come back and be that one nation that waits for Jesus. Some won't. They'll be out there. They'll be hanging out with their brothers from Judah and Benjamin and Levi, and they'll farm synagogues all over the Babylonian Empire, all over the Greek Empire, all over the Roman Empire. So that when it comes time for Paul and the others to go preaching, every city will have a synagogue, a landing place, a home base for the apostles to begin their ministry, to begin introducing the Gentiles to the Messiah who's come. That's not the plan anybody saw. <laughs> You're going to scatter us among the nations, bring a few of us back so we're here to crucify the Son of God and then repent and then become the nucleus of a church, and then the rest you're going to leave out there, and they're going to be places where the apostles can stop and um, get, get a little bit of support, a little bit of money in a bed for the night, so they can go preach Christ to the Gentiles. Do we get to vote on whether or not we want to be part of that? <laughs> and God says no. No. <laughs> God's fact, kingdom is not a democracy. You don't yeah. get a vote. Yeah. Well, In fact, again, God does not even tell them. All he tells them, really, is things are going to be very bad for a long time. He doesn't recant any of his earlier promises. Messiah is still coming. All nations will be blessed. But it's going to take longer than you think. It's not going to happen the way you plan. And what you thought would be the greatest way in the world for God to do this is a way that's not even part of his plan remotely. Do you have the humility and faith to embrace that and to wait on a sovereign God who is so much wiser than you, there's no comparison? That's hard. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. one, we think we know best. Two, we like our comfort. I, but I want to always have my house with its air conditioning and running water and uh, indoor plumbing and a car and, um, yeah, and, 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 and food in the refrigerator and a uh, uh, Costco nearby, you know, the, 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 are, are, aren't these automatic things that come with being a Christian or at least being an American Christian? Well, well what I, if can, one day I can not? say no, because Costco is like 40 minutes away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 40 minutes. Uh. Uh, see, that's why people should live in California. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> There's a Costco on every street corner. <laughs> yes. That's true. That's... And, and, and even, even to go back to what you were talking about, how the, the judgment that Elijah called down on Israel, it affected the 7,000. Yeah. The other bright side to that, and it ties into what you were just saying there, kind of in closing, I think, is that they went through all of that. They went through the three and a half years of famine. They went through the persecution by uh, Ahab and Jezebel, and they remained faithful by God's grace. Mm -hmm. God brought them through that tribulation yeah. because the the sheer fact that you are going to or even potentially going to experience some kind of tribulation in your lifetime does not mean that god is somehow not holding on to you yeah mm -hmm. it's just that's not how we visualize it yeah mm -hmm. which means we need to shift our visualizations a good deal yeah. preferably before the tribulation comes and, you know, if then the tribulation doesn't come and God sends mass revival and all your neighbors are patting in your door saying, tell us about Jesus. Well, awesome. wonderful. Awesome. Great. That's Praise just God the, for that. <laughs> praise God for that. But if he chooses another path, well, at least we won't be surprised. And our faith will be ready for some hard things or at least know that it ought to be ready for some hard things. So we're we're still in the middle of Kings. There's a long way to the end of Second Kings from where we are. And so we have lots of stories still to tell and history to yeah. follow. 
But here in the middle of it, we, we're being taught what it means to say God is sovereign. Not only that he can do what he wants, but he can do what we didn't want. And it's okay. Well, that is a good spot to end. Thank you so much for this discussion. Do we have any recommendations? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I recommended Tortured for Christ already you on a recent episode. Good. Because it's relevant, but I don't want to repeat myself. So I have a different recommendation. And that is a physical record CD or tape player in your house. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love Spotify. I pay for Spotify Premium because I use it all the time and ads are annoying. They really are. But I not too recently acquired a like a it's like a boom box, except with a record player. It does all the things. <laughs> oh yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And it's it's just so nice to be able to measure time physically. I feel like it's a different sort of nice thing to have in your life, especially in in the center of your home to kind of be like, this is what we're doing right now. And it kind of is a little bit more grounded than pulling something up on the internet as great as it is to be able to do that. So totally irrelevant, totally a luxury, totally nothing to do with suffering for the name of Christ. But I think it's really great to have a record player. Cool. Kind of brings the home together <laughs> audibly. <laughs> Greg? Um, I uh, People keep asking me if I'm having a good year teaching. I'm having a fantastic year teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. I have had far less to do. I'm at, finally at the point where most of my classes are scoped out and the outlines are done. And when I come home, I don't have a lot I have to do. So I've gotten back into a reading. And as mm -hmm. I've said before, my favorite reads are mystery stories. So first I went back and reread all of the Agatha Christie stories whose plots I couldn't <laughs> remember anymore. <laughs> and it was surprising how many I couldn't remember anymore, unless we'd seen a movie version in the last, you know, five years or so. Um, but having done that, I then went to um, Nigel Marsh, whom I, is an Australian or New Zealand lady who wrote English mysteries nonetheless. Cozy's kind of like Agatha Christie. And that was kind of fun. She always ties things into artsy stuff. But I went to her partly because I didn't want to go back to Dorothy Sayers, because I looked at my copies mm. of Dorothy Sayers, and they looked frigid. They looked culturally bound to a different time, place, and everything. <laughs> this, the covers really did not inspire me. But finally, having exhausted everything else that, was, that I could read <laughs> um, in my library, um, that I didn't want to read even less than Dorothy Sayers. Okay. <laughs> I will pick up a copy of Dorothy Sayers and I will see what's going on with her. I've so have forgotten what she writes like. I just remember there were some things about her writing style I didn't like. I was tremendously blessed, for lack of a better word. I don't think there's a better word. I enjoyed it a great deal. I found out, one, she is a superb writer, mm -hmm. that she does not take herself too seriously, mm -hmm. that she does sometimes write tongue-in-cheek, that sometimes she winks at you and you say, wait, you're supposed to be writing a story and you're supposed to acknowledge there's a reader here. She doesn't care. <laughs> um, but I also found that she is one of these, I'm sure other people would say annoying people, but they're the kind of people I like, who along the way <laughs> drop every little thing they've ever learned anywhere about anything. I mean, she has her characters, not just the hero, but other characters, because a lot of the people are upper class. Talking in Latin cliches, Greek cliches, <laughs> quoting Shakespeare, quoting Wordsworth, quoting whoever, <laughs> quoting the prayer book with wild abandon. There was one, I remember one section where she comments, and he didn't seem to respond. Perhaps it was because he didn't approve of what the prayer book was saying, or possibly because he had not read the prayer book in a very long time. <laughs> uh, it's like... I feel like I'm talking to educated people who read the kind of stuff I read and enjoy it. So, if you love books, you love reading, you love the broader culture of Western civilization and Anglo-American civilization, and just want to have a fun romp with a mystery story, I recommend go back and try Dorothy Sayers again. Mm -hmm. uh, she's better than I remembered her by a lot. She's not Agatha Christie, but Agatha Christie has a has a particular niche of... Um, she writes very, she's, she can be a very good writer. 
She can also be a lousy writer. She writes about spies, don't read her. But <laughs> she can write very, very simply and to the point with very good English style. Dorothy Sayers is not, because Agatha Christie's telling a really tightly written mystery. Dorothy Sayers isn't. She's just talking mm -hmm. about, here's this community of artists. Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you about the geography. Let me tell you about the topography. Let me tell you about fish. Let me, let me tell you about this, <laughs> these odd things about fish that actually have something to do with the mystery story. But, you know, you probably want to know about fish, don't you? Uh, let me tell you about how, let me tell you about artists. And, um, oh, yeah, this uh, this all starts because when uh, Lord, Lord Peter was looking around, he noticed that one thing was missing. I've just told you what was there and what wasn't. So you obviously know what's missing because you know about art, no doubt. So I don't need to tell you. Moving on. Um, you know, she's just, there's a kind of lightheartedness about her. Um, and she lives in a Christian universe. Universe, but she's not. She's not evangelizing. She's just enjoying. She's not preachy. She's yeah. not at all. And she, but but she's not ashamed. Mm -hmm. Lord Peter, her her hero, is not a Christian as we would conceive of it. But he was raised mm -hmm. in the church. He knows the Bible. He knows the prayer book. And and she's writing in a time when when non Christians talked about such things. It was part of their culture mm -hmm. and life. So they're fun, and mm -hmm. I recommend. Going, if you like mysteries at all, going back and trying Dorothy Sayers again. Yeah. I, I love Peter Whimsy as a yeah. character. Sorry, I'm going to I'm gonna cut you off and recommend a specific Dorothy Sayers mystery. Oh, which one? Um, Murder Must Advertise. Oh. Ah. I, I could have lived in that world for about three more books. I just thought that was so fun. Um, the cricket match was delightful. Okay. I have, to, I have to go back to that one next. I just uh, did um, the one where he meets... His wife, Harry oh, Vane, who's yes. on trial for murder. Uh, the poison, something poison. about poison. Yeah, strong poison. About, strong poison. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now I have uh, new which books was to lots add of fun. My library uh, <laughs> card. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you having have, fun isn't hard when you've got a library card. Thank yes. you, Arthur, and the cast. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so my recommendation, um, I think I have two. One is theology, and one is. Um, technically also theology, but it's Lewis. So everything is mm. theology when he writes. Mm -hmm. So starting with Lewis, uh, Paralandra, which of course. we, I've been reading it with my wife. Uh, normally she has a puzzle and I read that sounds because so cozy. it helps her focus, you know, it is very cozy. Mm -hmm. um, but we just read, I think it was chapter four or five of Paralandra because we had a big break. Um, between February and now, last night, basically. And uh, he meets the green lady for the mm. first time. And the whole thing is is just this delightful exploration. What would happen if someone from Earth talked to the Eve of another world and she was learning all sorts of new things just by your offhand remarks? And it, <laughs> it, it turns into, you know, what Lewis does best, which is... Um, philosophical slash theological debate and discovery disguised as witty dialogue. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so everything by Lewis is great, but Paralandra, I, I am finding a lot of delight in it. Uh, when mm -hmm. my first time reading it in high school, I did not catch or obtain much of that in my experience of reading it. So it's it's very nice to come back to it and, and actually find out that I'm enjoying it instead of slogging through it. <laughs> Uh, the second, uh, I'm going to recommend the website modernreformation.com. It's um, run by a lot of the same people who are guests slash hosts on White Horse Inn. So Michael mm. Horton and Adriel Sanchez. Um, I just looked on the website again to check. They, they have an article by Craig Carter, who is a the theology proper theologian. And really interesting topics. I haven't read everything on their site, but a lot of it has been really edifying and interesting and uh, worth worth my time for having read. So those are my two recommendations. Very good. All right. Well, thank you both again for joining us. And thank you to our listeners for uh, joining us on this episode for this discussion. If you'd like to follow us, you can do so on our YouTube channel uh, through Rumble. Uh, you can follow our Facebook page. Uh, you can subscribe to us through any podcast catchers. If, uh, if there's one that you're aware of that we are not showing up on, please let us know. If you would like to email us with anything, you can do so at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. We want to thank our financial supporters as well. You help us put out the shows uh, in a timely manner by helping us pay for the software that we use. 
Uh, if you would like to become one of our financial supporters, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. And a thanks to David Maxson for putting in the hard work of editing. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time. Well, seeing. <laughs> <laughs> in a manner of speaking. <laughs>